Here's a few news articles that I thought were pretty interesting. Um, Ireland is having riots and attacks similar to the time of the Troubles. Um, I don't really understand the details, but I know there's been for many decades two parts of Ireland, a Protestant part and a Catholic part, and part of it wants to rebel against England, and the other part wants to cooperate with England. And anyway, um, because of Brexit, this is somehow uh, making the border between them different again and threatening the unity of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. So there's, uh, they're having people uh, torch cars and attack people, and blow things up and all this jazz again. So there may be another fresh wave of Irish violence up there. The way things were back in the like 70s and 80s, I think. There was a whole lot up there. So the Asian attacks in America are continuing to be very prominent. My Asian friends are afraid to go out. Um, and uh, it's, so they, in New York City, they've begun putting undercover officers to catch them, and they caught someone um, yelling Asian slurs at people anti-Asian slurs and arrested them. There's an undercover officer to catch that. So a lot of it's happening. This is, of course, uh, entirely due to Trump, who encouraged his supporters to do this and used racist rhetoric and uh, went out of his way to encourage everyone to hate China and hate Asians, along with a lot of other groups. And uh, Trump remains incredibly popular among his base. He has totally taken over the Republican Party and they have not backed out from that, so uh, we can just expect this to continue, I think. Anyway, um, so there's another trope in the uh, Republican Party, which is that nobody is racist. Um, the Rich Lowry, the editor of National Review, wrote an article about four months ago saying there is no systemic racism in America. This is what they've said for a long time, that uh, all the people that claim to be discriminated against are just making it up. Uh, and uh, this is a very common right-wing talking point. And so now a medical journal said, of course, no physicians are racist. And yet there's enormous evidence that um, this is British medical care, I think. But anyway, the uh, no Journal of American Medical Association, there's tons of evidence showing that when black people go to doctors, they don't get fair treatment. Uh, they have worse outcomes. They don't get listened to. Their symptoms aren't taken seriously and so on, just like in all other aspects of life. Uh, people look at black people and say, oh, well, it's not really worth bothering you to take care of them or listen to what they say or anything because there's systemic racism all through our culture. There always has been. <laughs> and I think only a person with evil intent would try to deny it. I mean, we had slavery, <laughs> for crying out loud. You don't think that vanishes overnight. Nobody does. They're just lying if they say that, I think. Anyway, so the, the P1 variant, which uh, apparently first be it's significant in Brazil, I don't quite know where it started, is getting people really worried. One person traveled to Alberta, Canada and started a whole outbreak as it spread through there. And in Brazil, it is very serious. Um, it is make, um, it's made the number of deaths go up enormously high. This is month by month through the entire outbreak in Brazil. And a large number of these people are young, like 18 to 25 and such. So it's, uh, here's the uh, people 18 to 45, it has soared, as you can see, to about triple what it used to be. So uh, people are quite worried about that. I'm a little bit worried about all the young people that haven't been vaccinated yet in the United States who might possibly uh, catch it. But I think we're getting a lot of people vaccinated really fast in the United States, and hopefully we can avoid having it surge through here. Uh, so this guy, I guess, is the guy that wrote Curl, because now... Uh, somebody at NASA included CURL in some project, and so now the administrators at NASA are trying to get the, um, the developer of CURL, the open source uh, command line web browser, to provide formal documentation explaining where it's developed and maintained. See, this is a, this is a part of supply chain threat management. In, uh, especially since the SolarWinds hack, but really over the last several years, more and more government agencies and large corporations have been getting worried about supply chain security. If you used AppGet or Easy Install in Python or anything, you're, you're downloading stuff from some repository and you don't even know what country it's in and you don't even know who wrote it and you don't really know it hasn't been modified to have malware put in it. And so they're trying to 
take all the components of all the software and document where it came from. And so, you know, open source maintainers are now getting official letters from U.S. government agencies like NASA saying we need to know more about what country this was developed in and such. And of course, uh, if it was a commercial product, you might be able to get them to do that. But if it's an open source product, they're not used to having to explain themselves to some kind of agency. And uh, it does show something that I think people have known about for quite a while, which is that if you're using open source products, there is a serious issue with the security of what you're doing. You're, um, you really don't know where it came from. You really don't know that you've got the official version. You know, it's, it's an issue. So we're trying to get more serious about this. Anyway, Alexei Navalny, the primary um, opponent to Vladimir Putin in Russia. Uh, Putin tried to poison him and kill him, but he managed to survive be due to some errors in people that were supposed to lie and keep him in the country until he was unsavable, but he managed to escape to Germany where they actually treated him and saved him. So now that he came back to there, they've locked him in a prison and he's dying in prison. Uh, they're either poisoning him again or not treating him or something. And so his doctor, this is one of his doctors, tried to reach him and they arrested his doctors trying to reach him in prison. So it's uh, it appears to be a slow motion murder in prison now instead of the direct a murder of just poisoning him that they tried a few months ago. And uh, Biden is talking increasingly about seriously having sanctions against Russia for this. And they're putting bounties on our soldiers in Afghanistan to have them killed and their um, other things they've done. So we may actually see some pushback against Russia now that we don't have Trump in there who very much just believed that Russia was innocent and always took their side and everything. And there's another amazing thing. Um, the, the Hatch Act says that you cannot use your official position in government to uh, promote to politic, to campaign, or to push commercial products. And Trump just blatantly violated it, even to the extent of having the Republican National Convention at the White House, which is absolutely insanely in violation of this, and all of his administration just broke it all the time with no apparent consequences, but now they're finally getting around to punishing him. So the first uh, Trump official got punished for this, um, this woman named Patton, and she took, um, she went and took a film crew to, he was running a housing secretary, and she went to visit people in housing and film them, and without telling them what the purpose of this was, she then took those films and used it in a campaign at the Republican National Convention saying, see, we're nice to black people, we got them all these nice houses, and here they are saying nice things about the Trump administration. So um, that is the kind of thing that the Hatch Act is supposed to prevent, abusing your power in a position of government to campaign. Anyway, so apparently they're doing something about it. So I, the Hatch, uh, we may be moving a little bit closer to being a nation of laws where the laws actually apply to people instead of just being ignored. And so uh, there's an, some people say the, uh, the violence against Asian Americans, certainly motivated by Trump's rhetoric, may possibly cause Asian Americans to be more Democrats. That would be nice. It would be logical. Uh, we'll see what happens. And the uh, police officers at the Capitol, you know, there's a special police force just to protect the Capitol building, and a bunch of them got harmed and several of them killed in the insurrection on January 6th. And it was very clear at that time that there was no command structure. Their commanders didn't give them any orders. They weren't deployed properly. They weren't trained properly or equipped properly. And that is still happening. That's what they said. They're now beginning to quit. They, um, they still have not had any explanation of how it is that they were so unprepared for this when anybody that watched Twitter or Facebook could see it coming and why the, during the actual activity they didn't get any clear orders or any support. And they're still doing nothing about it. So... It kind of reminds me of the college. There's nobody in charge, and uh, they don't have confidence in the people above them. So some kind of cleanup is definitely needed in the Capitol Police system. We'll see if uh, the new administration can do anything about that. And this one I mentioned in my previous classes, but it's very relevant to these courses. The, 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 a uh, Middle East nation hired a spy from Israel to pose as a Fox News journalist and find out what was going on inside another government, and they used the tools we train you to use here. They made an Android app with a Metasploit shell in it, which is one of the homework projects in 128, to try to get um, information on try tricking people into installing that app, and then they caught them by using a Think's Canary token, which is in our, I think, a 123 or 124 project, 
um, so which is just an extra email address or web address that you put in something so that when somebody uses it you'll find out who they are and you just have these extra addresses that you're not actually using for any purpose and you're just listening on them to see when somebody else uses it this is a way to detect if someone has stolen your data or if somebody is using some file you provided them so it's uh it's interesting to see these very simple, almost script kitty tools that we have for homework are really in use by professional um, corporate espionage agents, which is essentially what this is. We well, guess it's international espionage. Anyway, so here we are. This is 129S, unless I, yep, good. And so we're down to here. Attacking backend components. And I got those slides here. So let's talk about this. All right. So uh, you, your web server platform will typically offer some degree of services to other servers and things on your network, and that's its application programming interface. So then you can uh, request a file or get various services from it. And sometimes they get that by issuing commands directly to the server. The web app might create a command line command to do something like get a directory of files or run a script or something. And when you do this, it tends to lead to command injection vulnerabilities. Here's one example by Perl. It's creating a command, du, which I think just shows you how much space is used. But anyway, here it is um, getting some kind of directory information from a directory, but it includes a parameter called dir. And that parameter dir is actually under the control of the user. So this is very much like the, uh, the first homework in this class where you had a, a ping form that you could in inject other commands into. So now if you have this dir and you give it a directory, it will give you the contents of the public subfolder of this folder. That's using this as it's intended. But since it's not filtering the data, you can use public pipe, then a space, cat space, et's password, and now it will take the directory of public and the pipe will take the output of that command and feed it as input to the next command where it'll be ignored and it prints out the cat here. So you end up with, uh, I can now execute an extra command on the server. And it's just what you did in the earlier projects. Um, all right, so this has happened many, many times in the real world. There's several projects here where you, we've been through where you use things like um, a uh, graphics library that was vulnerable. Here's HP Hewlett Packard OpenView, turned out to be vulnerable here. You could again, just put a pipe in this node parameter, and it would execute another command there. Um, it also happened to ASP, Microsoft's server-side scripting language. Once again, here's something that does a C command, C dir, dir name. So it's going to do a directory of a directory name, but the dir name is under user control, so you can inject code there. Um, and so here's a page you might see in going directory, and you can just put um, ampersand ampersand IP config and then it will do the directory and then do IP config to show you information about this just as a demonstration a proof of concept of course you could execute any command consistent with your privileges typically you don't have administrator privileges but you have some degree of privileges on the uh, server in this place and of course PHP is where this is really very common uh, local file inclusion or remote file inclusion are very common and if you use the eval, you can easily have uh, command injection also. So eval executes this string as a shell command. And if the user controls it, then you can execute those with the privileges of the web app. So if you want to find these things, uh, the simplest thing is just put in special characters uh, like these. These separate commands. So the second part will execute a backtick causes immediate command execution and takes the output and substitutes it in between the backticks. Um, and so one thing that you ought to be aware of, just like SQL injection, is even if your command injection works, it might very well be that you cannot see the output. So it, it's used in some way by the script. Like if I had a script where there was a, a button that said delete the log files to clear the logs, it would just delete the log, but you would never see the output of that command. It would just do it. So you'd have a... Um, if you could inject something else, it might have effect on the server, but you wouldn't see any output coming from it. So you'd have to use something like ping to make a time delay or make some kind of network connection to something you can find, like back to one of your servers, that sort of thing, if you want to get the output of the command 
or indeed get any real proof that your command has actually been executed. All right, so NS, uh, if you pass user input to NS lookup because you're trying to do a DNS lookup to make some kind of network connection, here's an example. They blocked some of the special characters, but not this special character. So you could create an in invalid domain name. That'll cause an error message that includes the domain name, and you can make the domain name include script code so that when it does it, it will evaluate that code in the error message. And we've seen this with the uh, SQL injection also. This is another way to do it. If you cannot directly see the output of the command, you can insert it so that the output will be in the error message. And then if you can see the error message, you'll be able to see the output of your script code. So if you want to avoid these, it is a poor programming practice to use these commands like eval that take text and then evaluate it at the command line. It's risky. If you're going to do that, you have to be very careful to filter the input so that it's not under the control of the user, so that it only chooses from a known list of good values or something like that. Um, all right, it's best not to put user input into these things. If you have to, you have to restrict it to known good values, or you're very likely to end up with script in, uh, code injection vulnerabilities. And then there's file inclusion. Any place where you refer to a file name, you might be able to put in dot dot slash or dot dot backslash and navigate to some unexpected file. Now, if you have proper permissions configured to where your web app is running with certain permissions and it doesn't have permissions to access other folders, that would limit the damage here. But if your server has unsecured direct object access where um, it does not actually have an intrinsic permission preventing the web server identity from accessing files, then you're going to have this problem. So here's a function, a get file ashx, that has a file name here. So you're supposed to see some allowed range of files by changing this name. But if I can put dot dot backslash, then I can go to Windows, win.ini, and so on, and see a file that I shouldn't uh, see. And when you do test a Linux server, they typically go for slash etc slash password, not a particularly important file, but a file that is always there. So you can see if you can read it. And in Windows, here's another one. Windows win.ini is a file that was present at least in older versions of Windows all the time. So it's an easy way to prove that you have the ability to reference a local file. And so here's uh, you can read or write to files. So you might find something sensitive, configuration files or passwords. Or you might be able to overwrite things that are important if you have high enough privileges, like software binaries that will then be executed, so you get the ability to execute code in a different context, or change configuration items that lower security settings, that sort of thing. So if you want to prevent these, there are um, various file system monitoring tools that check your critical files to make sure they have not been altered. Um, FileMon is there, Tripwire is a tool, Trust, these are various tools that just uh, you configure them to scan certain files and folders and to notify you if those objects have changed, which indicates, you know, if you are not putting on something like a system update, then those files should not be changing. So you can detect, you see, if you want to find if there's such a vulnerability, then you just inject a unique string everywhere and then filter the file system monitoring tool to see if this information ended up anywhere in the file system. So you monitor uh, detected things. So here's, for example, a, a Windows win.ini up here in the file name. And so you see that's the contents of the, that file. And uh, all right. And so you run some kind of monitor like Procmon that shows you all the file creation events and see if any of them have this special string. That would be a way to detect this. All right. So if you want to uh, get past simple filters. You can try forward slash and backslash URL encode it, or even double URL encode it, Unicode encode it. So you have these longer strings, double URL encoding, over long Unicode encoding with more than two bytes. Uh, all these are various ways to sneak the forbidden characters past simple character filters. <coughs> you can try double back dot dot slash dot dot slash hoping that it just goes through one layer of grep so it removes this one but it doesn't notice that doing that has left one in there these are all very much the same uh, tricks we talked about before with sql injection 
You can put in null characters sometimes, so if the app will let you upload a JPEG, but not an other file, you can create a file like this, which will pass the test to be interpreted as a JPEG, but it's actually referring to something else, because the null does not terminate the string that is used to test for the file extension, but it does terminate the string that's used to actually open the file. All right, so if you can read things, then you might be able to find configuration files that include credentials or other high-value data, or scripts or log files. And if you have write access, then you can write files that will later be run. Like you can put a startup script in somebody else's folder or the folder of the current user so that next time that person logs in, that script will be run. Uh, you can modify other files so the next time they use an FTP daemon, it'll run it and so on. You can find files that will eventually lead to execution. All right, so if you want to prevent these things, it's, that's the same old plan. Don't put user-controlled data into a file system activity. If you have to do that, then make sure that that data fits a list of known good inputs. Um, if you have to give them more freedom than that, then you should try to make sure you're after all decoding and decanonicalization, which means turning those things like percent %20 back into a space, then check for all these suspicious characters, and if you find them, stop. Don't attempt to clean up data containing dangerous characters and use it. We've talked about many times. That is how you let the hacker in. If you find something bad, you should just reject it entirely, make the user try again, and also uh, configure a defense like if they send some number of those items, like five such items in five minutes or something, then kick them off, cancel their session, freeze their account, because obviously they're up to no good. That's the sort of thing. Don't let them try over and over until they figure out how to bypass your defenses. All right, and so you make sure the uh, check before you do anything to a file to make sure that the file exists if it's supposed to and it's in the expected directory. You can use get canonical path to get the official expected path to it. So if they're trying to use dot dot slash or something, you'll find out what file, what folder it's really in. And then you can notice if somehow the input has been misinterpreted to go to some other folder. You can run the app in a Sharoot jail. This is uh, before there was virtual machines, there were Sharoot jails, which are a similar thing. You run the web app in a limited environment in a folder that has a few system commands it can use, but everything is trapped in that folder and there's no way to get out of it. And so it doesn't have access to the rest of the system, just sort of like a virtual machine. You can also do it in Windows by mapping a drive letter. Um, this is the original way to restrict this. After this came virtual machines, then came Docker containers. They all do approximately the same thing. They cause your app to run in a little sandbox without having access to the rest of the system. All right. And so file inclusion is very important, so you can do code reuse. And code reuse is really important to maintain consistency. So if you have something like an authentication function, you want to have just one of them. You want every app to use the same authentication function, so you make sure that you always make sure you know who somebody is. But that means you're including files in everything, and so you're going to have um, includes like this. And then uh, you might be able to include unexpected files. Like here's an example, here's a country parameter, and so it includes country.php, and this country is a user controllable parameter. So now I could inject other data. I could inject a backdoor or something. I can change the country to load some PHP file from another server, and uh, that's dangerous, of course. Local file inclusion is where you don't load data from another server, you load data from the same server. So you have to find some file already on the server that does something unexpected, but those are often there. Uh, one common source of these things is sample files. Anyway, so again, you just insert these things in a targeted parameters, put URLs to a server you control, and see if you're getting any requests. Then it actually tried to fetch something. Uh, a non-existent IP address will make a time delay, and so on. Um, and you can try putting a known executable on the server, a known static resource like win.ini and other things, just to see if you can uh, access any of these objects that you shouldn't be able to access. So we got some cahoots. This is 129s 10a. All right.
Understood. Afraid we're going to have just three, and that would kind of make it silly. seconds. Looks like that's it. All right, which one will let you add malware from a different server? That's file inclusion. Good. All right. Which one puts the web server in a restricted file system? root. Good. All right. Which defense detects modifications in the file system? Process Monitor will do it. We've been doing that quite a bit in the uh, Malware Analysis class. You can watch which libraries it's loading and so on. All right, what vulnerability is caused by eval? injection. Good. All right. back to here. Ah, and I'm seeing streaming up there. I hope it's uh, not fouling up for you people too. Let me know if it's fouling up for you. All right. So XML external entities. Uh, this is an interesting attack and it requires a little bit of understanding of how XML works. XML is just a way to format data to send it to a server, but it does have some sort of internal ability to define macros, and that's what we're going to exploit here. The main point of these XML requests is to have modern AJAX applications like Google Maps. 15 years ago, before Web 2.0, you would load a whole web page. If you click a link, it would just load another whole web page. But if you have something like Google Maps, you can have a map and just drag it to the left and it will load just a little bit of the map on the right. It doesn't have to reload the whole page. It makes the page dynamic. And so it does that by sending a request for just a small amount of data. This is going to send a search and then it gets a small amount of data back, like just the results from the search. Instead of loading a whole web page, it sends a little snip of data and gets a little snip of data back. 
And this is much better, of course, for dynamic web requests. So here's how Acunetics explained it. I found this online and thought it was very clear. So if you send a post here with hello world and you put it in XML tags, which look like HTML, an opening foo tag and a closing foo tag, then it gets this foo information and it replies just by echoing it back. This server will just return back to you whatever was in the foo contents. So you get hello world. So now this is an XXE um, payload. It defines an element called foo, and that element um, called foo with an element called bar. Bar is now an alias for world. So now I'm, I'm going to allow to have anything inside foo, and I have hello bar. This looks like an HTML symbol, but it's a user-defined symbol. It stands for what this entity tag tells me it is. So that is interpreted as hello world. So you can define your own special symbols, and you can define them up here in these entity statements. So what you can do, for example, is you could do this. You could make an entity called bar, which is world, and an entity t1, which is two bars, an entity t2, which is more t1s, and an entity t3, which is more t2s, and this is like a bomb where T1 is two bars and T2 is like two times four bars and T3 is that times four, so you get a lot of them. So this way you can make essentially a denial of service attack where you make the server do a lot of work calculating redundant paths through this. And so here's another one. I can now define foo any and I can define an entity that has a file in here and it will then, when I try to return this value, it will evaluate it as a system command happening here. So now it's going to load the contents of a system file and respond it back to me. That's the problem. This is essentially code injection, like SQL injection or the bash command injection we did with the ping form. You can inject, but again, you're injecting in a strange language. You're injecting in this XML entity expansion language. And you have to learn a little bit about this language to do fun injections. So here's another one. You can do a system where it goes on the web and loads a file. And here it is loading a file. So if I can reach the web server and then I can send up an XML entity, I can ask it to then load some other data from the internal network. And I probably wouldn't be able to directly reach that. Now, if you properly configured your network so that the web server is in a demilitarized zone with low privilege servers, and there's another firewall blocking all direct connections inside, then you might be OK. But typically, the web server can get on the database server, which is not directly accessible from the outside. And so this is a way to use the web server as a bot to launch an attack from that location inside the firewall against the rest of the network. So that's what these things are, entity references. And so now you can define these entities. You refer to them with this string, and they will have that meaning. So the XML parser, this one will load the file from a remote server and put it in place of the term XXE. And uh, so you'll get this result, um, this information from the file. And then you can connect to an email server. You can now refer to anything with HTTP. Now, you cannot just make any kind of protocol you want. You can only send HTTP requests, but you can send them to a port number. So this is going to try to send an HTTP request to an email server, which is probably not going to work, but it will at least tell me if there is an email server there. And then I'll get a response of some kind that will show me uh, some kind of error message or something protocol mismatch or something like that. And that would be enough for me to detect where the server is. Uh, here again is a denial of service where it loads data from the dev random file on a Unix system, which will never stop spitting out data. So you just get an endless stream of random bytes. Uh, if you want to inject into SOAP, SOAP uses XML. Now you might have a banking app. So the user sends this request from, a, from account, amount, and to account are the parameters you're sending with a normal POST request. Then, once it reaches the web server, it will then send a request to some back-end server that actually performs the financial transactions, essentially a database server, and it might use XML. So if it does, 
it'll have the from account here and the amount and the to account, and notice it's going to add this parameter, cleared funds, which is some kind of authorization parameter. It has decided whether you really have the money to spend from that account. You didn't get that from the user. The server added this, but it was sent as an XML request over the network to some other server. So I can inject that with this kind of thing. There's the normal SOAP message. I inject this. I set my amount to be all this red stuff. I put in 1430, and then I don't just put in numbers. I put in whole XML tags in the amount, and then I put an opening comment after that. So this is very much, again, like SQL injection. <coughs> so now I have actually included the cleared funds parameter. So the resulting SOAP message will look like this. Oh, and I, I put the other one down here in the to account. So now the opening comment will happen here and here subtracting away the real cleared funds tag that says false, but it would still have the cleared funds tag that says true that I put in. So now I might be authorized to do something where the authorization ultimately came from the user instead of from the server. All right. So here's what you get. Um, and you can also do it with just the opening comment tag only. That might clear the rest of this. Um, in principle, it should fail because there is no closing comment tag, but some XML parsers will accept it. So if you want to find these things, just try injecting like a closing tag and see what happens, because that should form an XML error. The closing tag with no opening tag. Uh, if you do get an error, then try this, and then that suggests you can inject both opening and closing tags, and then you might be able to get away with those attacks we were talking about. Um, you might be able to uh, you might be able to do stored XML injection, like the stored SQL injection, where you store data that includes these injected tags, and then when you use the data again, you might see the injection there. You can try injecting opening and closing comments in and see what that does. That might uh, break the logic in various ways. So if you want to prevent this, the simplest thing is HTML encode less than, greater than, and slash as these, so they cannot be misinterpreted as, as meta characters. All right, and you can inject into HTTP requests. There's two of them. There's HTTP redirection and parameter injection. The redirection is where you have, um, I control this parameter called location, where I can refer to something. And this is going to, um, retrieve it with a backend request. So I pass it up a location and it's going to fetch the content. So I can feed it a um, location that points to a local IP address with a local port number. And again, now I'll be able to scan the local network and I'll get error messages. Like this tells me I'm trying to send an HTTP request to an SSH server. But I get the banner and then I get an error message. So again, I can do basically a port scan inside the network to some extent by being able to inject an address where apparently they are originally only supposed to be a file name. That's using the app as a proxy. So now I can attack other devices to some extent from this device I have some control over. And parameter injection is where you include extra parameters. So here, for example, I'm going to go from account to account and amount. And that's going to uh, I send it up to the post. I'm only supposed to put in these parameters from account, amount, and to account. But if I add extra parameters, I add cleared funds equals true to my request, as you might do in Burp, then I've created a strange situation on the other end where there might be two results here. I'll have cleared fund equals true going in on the server side, and there might be another cleared funds equals false which comes from the server authenticating it. So now you've got this situation called parameter pollution, where the same parameter is defined twice with different values in the same request. And unfortunately, the specifications don't cover this, so different web servers just do different things. They might just use the first one or the last one or mix them together. So your, your parameter injected where you're not supposed to put it might end up winning. Or you might be able to turn the value into something invalid like an array so that it will have an unexpected effect when tested on the server. So here's the original backend request with cleared funds equals false added by the server. And here's the result of the added parameter. I injected cleared funds equals true. 
and it's going to add cleared funds equals false somewhere else. That's the front end request. And the back end request will now have uh, cleared fund equals true and cleared fund equals true and false. So we'll see what comes in with all. Anyway, all right, URL rewriting is how servers often implement crazy things like restful URLs. So if we talked about these things before, you might do pub user Marcus when what you really mean is um, mode equals view, name equals Marcus. And instead of using this standard format, you use restful URLs where you put parameters in this like they were directory names. And that can be implemented on an Apache server with a rewrite rule where it has a regular expression to find these slashes and then interpret if there's a pub here, this is not the user, and so on. So it, um, it will pick the parameters out of it with mod rewrite. And of course, that means you can trick it. If I feed it, I can inject an extra parameter here, the percent %26 being the code for an ampersand. And now when it changes it back, it will change the name equals to Marcus, ampersand mode equals edit. So now I was able to add an extra parameter at the end by putting it in what appeared to be a folder name. So it's a, just another version of injection, the same general principle. So mail services can also be vulnerable. Um, you often have some ability to send an email. You might have like a feedback form. You have a problem at your site, you can fill it out here and submit comments. So I can give my email address so it can reply to me the subject and the comment, but I cannot control the to email address because it's automatically, it's hard coded to go back to the customer support part of the website. And this is what will be created. The problem is if I haven't been careful, I'll be able to inject extra things here because SMTP just takes carriage return line feed, just like HTTP, it just takes lines of text. So if I can put in a carriage return, after this, which is the to address, I can just add a BCC address and send an extra copy. Now it's going to accept that extra line and send an extra copy of this to some other location. So I could do a lot of things. Um, here I am. Uh, that feedback request will go here. Now a normal correct one will have a message and it will end with just a period. A period on a line all by itself is how you end an SMTP message. So now I can do this. I can put in my subject, site feedback, carriage return line feed, and then I put in all this junk. I put in another mail from somewhere to somewhere with different data, and then I put in the period um, at the end. So when that is, it turns into this. I have mail from this receipt here, then I have a period, then I have a second mail here and a period, and then some junk in a period. So it sends a site feedback, and then it sends a mail that's completely under my control from their server, so I can abuse their server to send spam to people, and then there's a junk that will be discarded. And I could inject all that in something like the, the uh, from address. They also call this um, HTTP response splitting in the world of HTTP. Here you're doing it in SMTP. All right, so again, inject these things, try putting in new line characters, and uh, see if you can inject code that is then understood as authorized email code at the other end. So if you want to prevent these things, of course, you should not let people inject things like carriage return or line feed, um, and you should limit the length, and so on. And don't let them inject a line containing just a single dot. These are good control things to avoid letting your user create on your server. All right, so I got another Kahoot, which is 10, we're done with 10A, and I want 10B, which is right here. All right. All right.
right. That might be it. I'll give it a few more seconds because I see more total people in there. All right. All right, let's go. All right, so what attack sets the same value twice? Okay, that's parameter pollution. All right, which one declares a dock type? Yep, XML, external entity. A form of command injection. All right, which one uses comments? Simple object access protocol, SOAP. And uh, which one uses a line with a dot? All right, that's it. SMTP command injection. All right, that's Warren. All right. All right, same winners both times.